It's very, very easy to demolish a house. Kathleen and I, we like to watch those shows that are on HGTV. And there are many of them that they go in and the guys just love a particular day that's coming. And they refer to it as Demolition Day. You see, they get to jump through walls. They get to tear out toilets. They get to throw stuff out windows. They get to take up tile. They get to use crowbars. They get to use all kinds of hammers and just tear everything to smithereens. It's easy to destroy. But folks, rebuilding, that's a whole different ball game, isn't it? When it comes to rebuilding, it takes a lot of time. When you rebuild, it takes a lot of precision. There has to be a lot of decision making in an individual's mind as he rebuilds. And rebuilding is serious, serious work. In like manner, it's much easier to destroy a person than it is to try to build that individual up, isn't it? See, there's a lot of things that it is easy to do when it comes to other individuals. It's easy to criticize. It's easy to find flaws. It's simple to find fault. It's very, very easy for us to discourage another individual's efforts, isn't it? It's easy for us to destroy a person's dreams. It's easy for us to say no. It's easy for us to highlight all the obstacles as to why something cannot be done. Folks, all of that, that's easy. And sadly, sometimes we begin pretty good at it, don't we? You see, being an encourager is not as easy. Our theme for this year is Seeking Higher Ground in 2021. And each month we present a lesson that revolves around that particular theme. And this morning our lesson is Seeking Higher Ground in Encouragement. We've got four points that we're going to be talking about. Bill, one of them has 11 points. So you know we're going to be here a while. Number one, what is encouragement? There's been many times that I have defined the word courage in lessons. And notice, if you will, that the very root word of encouragement is what? Courage. That little word courage very simply means this, to have heart. Notice we have the little word E-N, in, courage. Very simply, the definition of encourage is this, to instill heart within another individual. What a beautiful definition of a term. Dictionary.com gives two definitions of the word. Number one, to inspire with courage, spirit, confidence. I like that little word, inspire, don't you? A second definition that they give is this, to stimulate one to do something. There are some synonyms to this word encourage. And they are this, embolden, hearten, reassure. My friends, when you and I encourage another individual, we are doing everything we can possibly do to instill courage, to inspire, to get them to do things, to build them up, to give them assurance, to give them confidence deep within them. Encouragement. I find it interesting that the Bible has passage after passage after passage that exhorts us to encourage others. When I went on the internet and I just typed in passages that teach encouragement, this first passage always was top of the list. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11. 
Notice what Paul writes. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as ye also do. The key word is edify. Edify one another. That little word edify very simply means this. Build one another up. It is the exact opposite of tearing each other down. Folks, listen to me. It's easy for us to destroy each other. It only takes a word, two words, a few criticisms, and you'll run somebody right out the back door. And folks, it can take months and months and months of encouragement to get somebody to do something. You see, it's easy to destroy. And Paul says, don't do that. Paul says, what I want you to do is I want you to edify one another. Another passage, Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but rather that which is good. To what? To the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Again, Paul says, when you use your tongue, when you use your lips, when you use your mouth, when you use your speech, edify the individual to whom you're speaking. Wouldn't you like to bring Paul in and ask him, Paul, when you said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, in this context, what are you talking about? Because he contrasts it with what? With edification. Don't tear each other down. Don't use horrible words toward one another. No, if you're going to talk to one another, you speak that which is good to what? To the use of edifying. You build each other up through your conversation. Don't tear one another down. Another passage that we're all familiar with. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Look what Paul says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. There's five points in that one verse that are interesting. Number one, he tells us, let us consider one another. Folks, that little word consider means this, to fix your eyes upon, to be attentive to, to observe carefully. As members of the body of Christ, as members of the family of God, you and I are supposed to have a deep, deep concern for one another. Not a handful around whom I'm sitting. Not two or three that correspond with my personality. Folks, we are to consider one another in the body of Christ. You and I are to have care for every Christian in our congregation. But notice secondly, he says, I need you to do something else. Not only consider one another, but I want you to provoke one another to love and good works. Look at that little word provoke. To incite, to arouse, to inflame, to motivate. I want to do everything I possibly can do to energize you in the Christian faith. I want to do everything I can possibly do in order to get you to do more and more and more in the Christian faith. I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to bring you down. I don't want you to do less, folks. I want to inflame your spirit to do more. Now here's what's interesting. How do we do that? Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Isn't that amazing that he puts that that statement right in the middle of this context? Folks, listen to me. One of the reasons that we have an assembly, one of the reasons that God wants us to come together is 
so that you and I can look at each other, that we can consider one another, that we can fix our eyes on one another, and so that we can provoke one another to love and good works. You can't do that sitting at home. can't do it. You don't do me any good sitting at home. They're in the worship service, do you? Folks, the assembly is God created. It serves an important function. He says, don't forsake the assembly. You come to the assembly. You consider one another. You provoke unto love and good works. And he also says that in that assembly, you exhort one another. There's that word again. You build each other up. Isn't it wonderful to know that there are other Christians, that there are other individuals that are of like faith, that they're going through similar experiences, that they're struggling just like we are, we can talk to one another about our concerns, about our problems, about our difficulties, and we can build each other up and keep one another faithful. And notice he says, and so much the more. That little word means great quantity, vast, large. Folks, listen to me. We can't encourage one another too much. Did you know that? You've never seen a person walking around complaining about their bucket being too full of encouragement. Have you? They just encouraged me way too much down there at that church. I'm not going back. Who says that? Now it only takes one word of discouragement, doesn't it? But you can take all the encouragement you can possibly load on an individual and they will never, ever tell you to stop encouraging. God's Word is filled with passages telling us to encourage each other, to edify one another, to build one another up. And I find it interesting too, in Scripture we have many, many examples of individuals who are encouragers and oftentimes right in the midst of discouragement. That's what's interesting about the text. Take for instance, Joshua and Caleb. We know about those twelve spies that went out to spy the land, didn't we? They come back and ten of them have this evil report, the Bible says. There's giants in the land. There's walled cities there. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way that we can take that land. And two, stand up to encourage the people, don't we? Joshua and Caleb stand up and say this, the land through which we have gone is indeed a good land. A good land. Now listen to him. If the Lord delight in us, He will give it us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. In the midst of all that discouragement, in the midst of all the no we can't, one man, two men, stand up and say, oh yes we can. What a land is over there. And guys, if God delights in us, guess what? He will give us that land. It's not an impossibility. We need more Joshua's and Caleb's, don't we? Remember Jonathan? Don't you ever get a Jonathan for a friend? You hold on to Jonathan. Jonathan was a close friend of David, even though he was Saul's son. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 23 verse 15 that David had gone out into the wilderness and he was out there basically alone. And Jonathan heard about the plight of David. And the Bible says this, And Jonathan, I find it interesting that he describes him, Saul's son, went to David in the wood and strengthened his hand in God. You know what Jonathan could have said? I ain't going out there to let David. He wants part of my kingdom. I'm not going out there to David. I've done everything I can do right here around to help him escape and to get away from my dad. There's no way I'm going out there. I'm not going out there. What if I get caught? Something may happen to me. My dad may put me to death if I go out there. Oh, no. He went to him in the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Folks, here is an encourager, is he not? Jesus 
had told His disciples that He was going away, didn't He? And listen to what He says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. In the midst of discouragement, guess what Jesus says? Let not your heart be troubled. What is He doing? He's lifting them up. He's building them up, is He not? There's several passages in Scripture wherein Barnabas is a major encourager. Did you know that? In fact, he was nicknamed by the apostles the Son of Consolation. The Son of Encouragement. The Son of Exhortation. Wouldn't that be a wonderful title to wear? You are such an encourager that they just name you the son of encouragement. Saul had converted to Christianity. But when he came back to the realms of Judea, the Christian brethren didn't trust him. They knew what old Saul had done. He'd been an enemy of God's people, had he not? He had arrested individuals. He had thrown them in prison. He was right there at the stoning of Stephen. He was an evil man. And all of a sudden now he shows up on your doorstep and he says, Guess what, guys? I'm a Christian. Yeah, right. The Bible says that Barnabas took him and brought him unto the apostles and declared unto them how the Lord, or how he had seen the Lord, and that he spake to him, and how he had boldly preached in Damascus in the name of Jesus. Folks, here's a man who goes out to Paul, he takes him into the apostles, and guess what he does? He vouches for him. You've got to stick up with this man. This man is a convert. This man is a changed man. This is a man that's now preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes, he used to do this, but he's not doing that anymore. Now we need to embrace him. Now we need to love him. Now we need to support him. What an encouragement. To old Paul. Paul also was an encourager. Why do you think he wrote almost half the New Testament? He did that to encourage individuals, didn't he? Those churches were struggling. Those churches were having troubles. And when you go to Ephesians 6 and Colossians 4, he writes to these churches and he says that he's going to send a man to them. A man by the name of Tychicus, he describes him as follows. He is a beloved brother and a faithful minister, and he will show you all things. When he gets there, he'll tell you about our affairs. And listen to what Paul says. When he gets there, he will comfort your hearts. Why did Paul send Tychicus? Because he needed somebody to encourage the brethren, folks. They'd heard about Paul's struggles. They'd heard about Paul's difficulties. They too themselves were struggling in the faith. So what does Paul do? Paul immediately dispatches a man in order to go there and let them know everything's fine with Paul and I want you to be comforted in Christ Jesus. What an encouragement. Here's the question, folks. How do we do it? How do we encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ? 400 points. Number one, pray for others. Listen to James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another. Do we do that much in the church? Occasionally. Right? What we think that means is, we think that means that when a person has committed a major sin, they come forward and sit on the front row. That's not what the text is really indicating. That, that's part of it. Folks, we ought to be always able to confess our faults one to another. And what do you do with that kind of information? 
spread it. Ooh, did you hear what he just told me about him? Get on the phone and tell everybody. Condemn him as an evil, nasty, wicked person. Confess your faults one to another. Listen to him. And pray one for another that ye may be what? Healed. You see, there's times when an individual is struggling with something in his life. He comes to us and he tells us what's going on, what the problem is, what the difficulty is, what the sin is, what the fault is. And guess what we do? We are to get on our knees with that individual and pray for that man, hoping that he can be what? Healed. You see, it's part of what? Encouragement. Number two, reading Scripture. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Folks, listen to me. We ought to be well versed in the Scripture. Well enough versed that when an individual comes to us, we can turn to a passage and that passage can heal their heart, can it? Number three, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just do this? Speak kind words to one another. The Bible says this, pleasant words are as an honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Kind words. There's an older couple, they've been married about 60 years. Somebody came to them and said, you know, we need to know the secret. How do you stay together? Sixty long years with one another. Both of them, almost at the same time, spoke two words. Be kind. Just be kind. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could all be that way all the time? How about this next one? Be a generous giver. We're back to a man by the name of Barnabas again. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Individuals had gathered there for a one-week feast. And then they thought they were going to go home, but that didn't occur. The Holy Spirit was poured out. The church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was established. Individuals obeyed the gospel, and those individuals wanted to stay in fellowship one with another. But you prepare for a week. What happens the second week, the third week, the fourth week? You start running out of supplies, don't you? Start running out of food, start running out of provisions. Well, guess what the early church did? They didn't look at them and say, Ah, you need to go home. You're becoming a burden on us. The Bible says this of Barnabas, having land, sold it, and brought it to the apostles and laid it at their feet. I don't own any land. (laughs) But I know this, land is valuable, isn't it? And once a person acquires a piece of land, guess what they don't want to do? They don't want to give it up, do they? And here is a man who sees a need in the early church and guess what he doesn't hesitate to do? He immediately goes out, sells the land and just brings the money to the church. Wouldn't you love to know how much that land cost him? You see folks, sometimes our giving can encourage individuals, can it not? You have a missionary come and that missionary expresses his needs pours his heart out to us for an hour. These are some of my needs. And we just let him go with a $50 check to cover his expenses. He's in need, folks. What if the church told him, Sunday, we're going to gather together and we're going to take up a collection for you. And we're going to send that money and you take that money and you take care of some of these needs that you've talked about. And rather than a $50 check, he gets $5,000 given to him. Folks, you don't think that will encourage a missionary? Be present. Be present. 
not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Be present. Because Christianity is about teamwork. Christianity is about working together. Christianity is about being together. Christianity is a fellowship. It is a family. And we've got to be present one with another. Notice I've got up there the U.S. Open Tennis Championship. Kathleen goes, oh, I'm glad that's over today. Love the four major tennis championships. They got a good one at four o'clock today, folks. History's about to be made. Last year at the U.S. Open, zero audience. COVID. Nobody was in the stadium. Can you imagine that? It's like you go out there and you're playing a major open like it is a practice match. Ooh, that's fun. This year, stadium is packed. Packed. I'm talking thousands and thousands of individuals there, folks. They're about to set records on how long the matches have gone to full length. Five sets for the men, three sets for the women. And those individuals who are the participants, one of the things that they will say to those individuals in the stands after every match is this, thank you, thank you for encouraging me. Thank you for being here. Thank you for enabling me to win this particular match. Folks, you don't think presence is essential? The presence of an audience can radically alter a match at a tennis championship. It can radically alter the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we make a decision not to be here, folks, we need to rethink that kind of a decision. Listen to others. It's another way to encourage somebody. Just listen. You don't have to talk. Just hear what they've got to say. Listen to what the writer of Proverbs says. The heart of the prudent getteth wisdom. The ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. I want to seek knowledge. I just want to understand. I don't have to give advice. I don't have to solve your problem. I don't have to be some guru to you. All I need to be is someone who does everything I can possibly do with my ears to understand. That's all. Just listen. Be willing to forgive. Remember that woman taken in adultery in John the 8th chapter? I bet she was pretty discouraged when she was brought in by those Jews, wasn't she? Here's a woman taken in adultery in the very act. The law says to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? Fine, let's stone her. But let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Everybody leaves. It's just Jesus and the woman. And what did Jesus say? Go thy way and sin no more. He acknowledged the sin. He acknowledged that she was in adultery. But what did He do? He forgave that woman that transgression, didn't you? You see, sometimes that's all individuals need is just a little bit of forgiveness. How about this one? Stand for others. Stand for others. Just write that verse down. 2 Kings 4 verse 27. There's a widow woman who has a son and her son dies and she approaches Elisha. She is distraught and she grabs his feet. And there's the servant of Elisha there and Elisha is doing, or the servant is doing everything he can do to get this woman away from him. And Elisha says this, let her alone. For she is vexed in her soul. You see, sometimes a person just needs a person to stand for them. Leave him alone. Quit pestering him. Quit being on his back all the time. Quit trying to find fault constantly. Quit trying to condemn him. Let him alone. You see, wasn't that what that woman 
had spoken about her when she came and washed the feet of Jesus? What is this? Jesus said, let her alone. Folks, sometimes we just need to let people alone. Stand up for those individuals. Commend the positive. We all are very familiar with that story about Martha and Mary. Oh, Martha. She's not too hip on Mary on this occasion, is she? I'd love to have seen that woman in action, seen her eyeballs every time she passed by and saw Mary just sitting there listening to Jesus. She needs to get out of that chair. She needs to come help me serve. I can't keep doing this all by myself. Look at that woman. Folks, she was so irritated, she went to Jesus about it and told Him, Bid her therefore to help me. Here's what Jesus said. One thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, and it shall not be taken away from her. See, Jesus saw the what? He saw the positive, didn't He? You know, folks, sometimes serving, cleaning up, whatever it is, it can just wait a while. Because sometimes there's something more important. And on this occasion, the more important was listening to the precious Word of the living God. And Jesus commended Mary and didn't put her down for not helping her sister. Another way we can encourage individuals is to remind them of the great truths of Scripture. Folks, God sees everything. God cares for us, does He not? God hears our prayers. God protects us. And if there's no other truth than this one, we need to remember it. Our Lord is coming again. Be faithful, be diligent, be stalwart, be steadfast, don't give up. Why? Jesus is coming again. Great truths encourage brethren. How about this one? Folks, just give some people some assurance. Just some assurance. There's two sides of assurance. Number one, alleviate fear and doubt. Number two, express the idea of, yes, you can. We've already talked about Joshua and Caleb, have we not? Joshua stands before those people and he says this, Only rebel ye not against the Lord. Neither fear the people of the land. They are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. The Lord is on our side. Fear ye not. Folks, what was he doing? He was reassuring those individuals, was he not? Don't be scared. Don't be fearful. Guess why? God's on our side. We can win. We can take the land. That's what they needed to hear. Just some words of encouragement, folks. There are 11 ways to encourage other individuals As I was thinking about this lesson, a thought came to my mind. And the thought was this. Quit asking why all the time. Why was this done? Why do you want to do that? Why should we? Why, why, why? Folks, that why question can be pretty discouraging, can it? Let's go back again to that illustration with Jesus and that woman who anointed His feet with oil. Why was this waste made? Why, why, why? That ointment could have been sold and it could have been given to the poor. Why, why, why? The minute you ask the why question, you put a person on the defense. Did you know that? That's exactly the way they feel. I've got to defend myself now. Why? I'll tell you why. And now we're what? Now we're right in the middle of a fight, aren't we? It happens all the time. Folks, rather than asking why all the time, why don't we look for the purpose behind the words of the actions? 
You see, it's easy to just ask why, why. It takes a person of maturity to stop and to try to think and reason about something. He said this because. He did this because. And here's what you're going to find interesting. When you do that, sometimes you're going to find that there was a very good reason behind what the individual said or behind what the individual did. And all of a sudden, when you find that out, you go, Oh, I didn't know that. Let's be careful in our treatment of one another. And folks, let's do everything we can do not to practice demo day on our Christian brethren, but let's build one another up in the most holy faith. We'll conclude with Romans 15, verse 2. Paul writes the following, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good unto what? Unto edifying. There's the command of Paul. Let's build each other up in the holy faith. Let's make each other better. Let's inspire one another. Let's instill heart deep within the soul of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Folks, anybody can tear something up. Anybody. And it's fun sometimes, isn't it? But it takes a person of skill and maturity to take an individual and build him up to be the kind of person that he needs to be. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. And we want you to be. The steps are simple. They'll never change. They were given by our Lord. You hear the Gospel. You repent of sins. You confess the sweet name, or you believe in Jesus as the Christ. You then repent of sins, you confess the name of Jesus, and then you're immersed into Christ for the remission of sins. Do you need to do that this morning? You're Christian, where are you in your Christian walk? Are you faithful? Are you dedicated? Are you loyal? If the Lord comes back today, will you stand before Him justified? That's, that's the question, isn't it? Do you need to respond to this invitation once you come as we stand and sing?